Hello and welcome to another episode of Dice and Dachshunds. I almost said Dice versus Dachshunds. That would be interesting. Unfortunate. <laughs> I think the word is unfortunate. <laughs> anyway, I'm Diana. And I'm Matthew. Buddy and Mikey are on the couch because it's really hot, even in the basement. But we are nonetheless here uh, to talk about some games that we played recently and in a few cases not so recently. Yeah, it's a rough day to be a long-haired dachshund. So the first game we wanted to talk about is one that we actually got for last Christmas and played a while ago called At the Gates of Lo Yang by Uwe Rosenberg, who also designed Caverna, which regular listeners to the podcast may remember as one of my favorites. Yeah, he also designed Agricola, Lahav, Feast for Odin, which we're going to be talking about later in the episode, Patchwork, Cottage Garden, and a lot of other games. I guess the Gates of Luoyang was an early one that got reissued? Yes, uh, it recently got republished by Tasty Minstrel Games. It was one of the first games in his big box series, sort of in sequence with Agricola and Lahav. So in the Gates of Luoyang, everyone is a farmer. And you have a set of fields, and you're trying to grow various vegetables on those fields and then bring them to market. And you have regular customers whose orders you're trying to fulfill. And then you can have sort of walk-in customers who will pay you more, but then if you don't fulfill your regular orders, your regular customers will get unhappy, and your fields only grow a certain vegetable for a certain amount of time, and some fields will grow this vegetable, but not that one. And so you're trying to sort of manage all your resources. What this means, of course, is that this game has an enormous bag of wooden vegetables. There are wooden radishes in this game. We all know what I like in a game, right? They're pretty cute, wooden vegetables. In terms of farming, he ended up using a very similar system when he designed Caverna, and I assume that it's similar in Agricola, although I have to admit that I've never actually played Agricola. I kind of went straight to Caverna. You need one example of a vegetable representing that vegetable's seeds to sow in a field, and that propagates, and then you can harvest from that field. Whereas only certain turns in Caverna allow you to harvest vegetables and allow vegetables to grow at the gates of Luoyang. Growing, harvesting, and selling vegetables is the core mechanism of the game. You're going to be able to harvest every turn from what you've planted. We played this game a while ago, and so we're not going to be going into a lot of the details of how the economic system works and how exactly the farming works, but you have to collect fields and grow vegetables on them, sell them to customers, and try to end up as the top farmer in your little village. And it's fun. It's a little lighter than Caverna, or A Feast for Odin that we'll be talking about a little later, as Matthew mentioned. It's still not exactly a party game, but it was pretty easy to pick up and easy to play, and we haven't played it again, but I would like to sometime. One of the interesting aspects is how you get points in this game. You actually buy your points and the first point you buy each turn of the game only costs you one coin so if you don't have that coin to spare you're really setting yourself back because any subsequent points that you buy on that turn will cost you the point value that you're going to so if i'm at four points at the beginning of the turn i can go to five points for one coin but to go to six points will cost me six coins. This punishes you for not leaving a little bit of money on hand, but it also reins people in. It's harder and harder to climb up that ladder and put a lot of distance between yourself and the other players. Another aspect of the game that's really interesting is the, I can't remember the name for it, it's like the market square or something like that, and it's sort of a reverse drafting system. Each turn, once you've done your farming and your market work and all of that, you're going to get to play cards that are additional stalls where you can trade vegetables in for other vegetables, which is a good way to 
get new plant types that you need to sow. You can play cards to be one-time customers or recurring customers, sort of ongoing contracts. Or you can play cards for different abilities. If I remember correctly, it has been a while. At the end of this part of the game, you're going to play one card from your hand and one card from this center pile where people have been discarding cards. If you have two cards in your hand that you really want to play, at some point you're going to have to put one of them down in the pile because you go around the table and everybody's putting a card down on the table, or they're taking a card from the table, playing another card from their hand, and dealing themselves out of that portion of the turn. So you have to somehow sneak that card you really want to play from your hand down on the table and hope that nobody gets it before it comes around to your turn again to either put down another card or pick a card from the pile to play. Or you can just keep an eye out and hope that somebody else plays something from their hand that's really going to help you and then you pounce on it on your turn and play that plus something else from your hand. It's a really interesting, I don't even know how to describe it. It's not drafting in the traditional sense. It's not really bidding. It's very unusual. And there's a lot of double think going on. I know that he knows that I need this. If I put it down, it's not going to help him, but he might take it just to keep me from getting it. Whereas I'm down to two cards in my hand and I need to discard one card to the center at this point, but it's really going to help my opponents, and I don't want to do that, but I don't want to discard the other one because I want that one to be the one that I played from my hand, and I don't see everything, anything in the middle pile that I want to use yet. So this game, Diana's right, it is lighter in that... There you don't are, have to keep track of as many steps. Right. There are a lot fewer pieces to the game, but... There's a fair amount of strategy in that simpler construction. Well, that tends to be the way it goes. I mean, it's the simple, abstract games that are the ones that are, you know, chess. How deep do you want to go in chess? As deep as you want. Yeah. Uh, simpler the game, deeper it can go. Well, I, I think there's an awful lot of depth in more complicated games, too, I oh, think. Oh, it's not that there isn't. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that apropos of nothing comment, I'm usually the one that comments on the aesthetic. The aesthetic is fairly similar to something like Caverna. It's kind of cheerfully cartoony with wooden vegetables, because how cute is that? Well, shall we move on to A Feast for Odin then? Uh, sure. So as we mentioned several times earlier, Feast for Odin is another Uwe Rosenberg game that we have. It's much newer. The mechanic of A Feast for Odin basically is that you have a board and you can get more boards in the course of the game and you are trying to cover up those boards as much as possible. They are covered in negative points and if you can get little cardboard tiles of various shapes and sizes to cover them, to cover up those negative points, you can not have those negative points at the end of the game. And then the other boards that you get are also worth a certain number of points, and then they have a certain number of negative points on them. And so usually it's even, or maybe they'd be worth one or two points with nothing on them. And then you have to put down stuff in order to get as many points as you can from that board, either the main board or an accessory board. And the way that you do this is that you have a bunch of little Vikings, and they go and get stuff mostly food. And then you have to feed your Vikings, and you can place miscellaneous food or treasure that the Vikings have gone out and gotten on your boards to cover negative points. And there are a variety of rules about how things can be placed. You know, two of one color can be placed next to each other, but this one can't be placed next to this color, that sort of thing. And there are several spots where if you completely surround a given square, then you get what's on that square. But that's sort of the basic idea, that you're covering little squares with negative points. When you surround something, what that icon represents is a recurring income for the rest of the game. So it forces you to really adjust your strategy, but the rewards, especially if you do it earlier in the game, can be pretty significant. 
So if you've played Uwe Rosenberg's games Cottage Garden or Patchwork, you've seen where the main portion of the game is covering up different spots in order to score points. Feast for Odin takes that and then bolts it onto a really pretty complex game in the style of Caverna or Agricola, where you're collecting food, as Diana said, but also various trade goods, skins, weapons, that sort of thing, and laying them out in your village square or in additional islands you can explore or huts and other storage buildings that you can build in this sort of bizarre Viking feng shui in order to claw back from the negative points that you start with displaying on your board. This game is really intimidating to look at on the table, but... So many little pieces, oh my gosh. It has a lot less wood than Caverna, but it also has several decks of small cards and a truly astonishing number of cardboard tiles and associated sideboards. And when you look at the worker placement spots, while Caverna starts you with a decent number of spots and then slowly spools out additional spots as available over the course of the game, A Feast for Odin starts with all of its spots available, and every spot is connected to other spots thematically that get more powerful the more Vikings you assign to them. So technically it has something like 60 worker placement spots that you're able to look at and choose between from the very beginning of the game. And that's understandably very intimidating. It helps to look at them as strata and look at the rows as, okay, this row tends to do this certain thing. What I may get may change depending on which place I choose in that row, but what I'm really doing is deciding on a row and then deciding how many of my workers I need to commit to go to a less powerful but less expensive or a more powerful but more expensive flavor of that action. It's not quite as simple as that makes it sound because there are some rows where some of the spots are different more than just you send more Vikings, you get better things, but that helps simplify what you're looking at a fair amount, I think. Once you have gotten that amount of the hang of it to see, okay, this is the row about getting resources from the resource board, and this is the row about hunting and getting meat, and this is the row where you can get sheep to raise and this sort of thing, that part gets a lot less intimidating. And it becomes just really thematic. You've got Vikings and uh, they're going off on excursions and getting their stuff and they can go and pillage and get treasures or they can go hunting and get meat and skins or they can go off and mine in the mountains and get rocks, you know, stone for building. And then at the end of the round, you have to feed them unless you send them off to colonize someplace, in which case then they get you points and you don't have to feed them anymore. It's good to have more Vikings because they get you more stuff, that you can get more stuff on a turn by sending them out. Toward the end, it's good to have fewer Vikings so that you don't have to feed them. When you send Vikings out to colonize, you're still not giving up the workers, which is an odd aspect of this game that is a little hard to wrap your head around when you first play it because We're so used to, especially in Uwe Rosenberg games, the more workers you have, the more you have to feed them. And if you choose to have fewer workers, well, then you have fewer mouths to feed. In this game, you get additional Vikings as the game progresses automatically. And when you use one of your ships to convert it to a colony ship, it acts a bit like... The ships in Lahav, one of his much older games, in that it acts as a constant source of food to cover some of your workers, but you're not actually giving up the workers. 
Another unusual aspect of Feast for Odin, if you're an Uwe Rosenberg fan or a Eurogame fan, is that some of the actions actually involve rolling dice and you can fail on that die roll. For those who are not familiar, the kind of old, age old split between European style board games or Euro games and American style board games or Ameritrash games is that it is exceedingly rare for a European style game to ever have a situation where you roll a die and that die determines whether what you're trying to do succeeds or fails. They can have dice, but those dice are usually determining what resources are available, how much you get of a particular thing, what sorts of actions you can take in a turn, that sort of thing. But when you choose to do something, that something will happen, barring some other interaction from another player. And since Euro games also tend to be lower conflict, it's more about streamlining your strategy rather than getting lucky with any sort of die roll. That's why some people really hate Champions of Midgard, because it's a European-style worker placement game in every respect, except at a certain point you're going to be rolling dice to see if your Viking succeed in fighting something, and it's entirely possible, although there are ways to mitigate the luck, that you'll send out all your Viking warriors that you've spent several turns of the game beefing up, and that they will completely fail. Now, Rosenberg is very apologetic about putting in these dice rolls. He actually talks about it a little bit in the manual. And if you fail, you get some consolation prize resources that are going to make it more likely for you to succeed and succeed more effectively the next time you try to do it. So he's trying to bridge the gap to get some of that excitement of risk without punishing being unlucky too heavily. Basically, it's when you're hunting or whaling, so you have a weapon and you're going up against a wild animal, so who knows what might happen? And so you have to roll a die, and there are cards with different weapons on them that are used against different critters, and the number of cards you have can help mitigate against not having the die roll you want. Is there anything else you wanted to say about A Feast for Odin? It's difficult to teach because there's so much going on. And because of that, we haven't gotten to play it as much as I'd really like. And it takes up an awful lot of table space. Oh my gosh, so much table space. If you thought the Caverna box was huge, Feast for Odin is actually thicker. And pretty much packed to the gills with cardboard. I don't know that it's quite as heavy because it doesn't have as much wood, mm-hmm. but but it's it's a really large box that is very full. I like it, though. Maybe I'm just a glutton for hard games, complicated games. So another game that we played much more recently in this case, which is not an Uwe Rosenberg game, but we thought that it went a little bit thematically with it because it's also about farming and being in a town, is Village. Matthew can probably tell you, like, who designed it and stuff. I think it's Inca and Marcus Brand. They're uh, fairly well-known designers in Germany, I think, and they actually also designed the Exit games that we're going to be talking about in a subsequent episode. So in Village, each player is representing a family of little meeples, and you want your family to become the preeminent, most well-known family in the Village. And so you can do this a couple of different ways. Your villagers can go out and become, and this is a very medieval sort of village, they can become farmers, they can travel, or travel is difficult and expensive, they can go into the governing of the town, they can go into the church, and your little meeples are marked with little numbers, and that number is the generation. And so you start out with a couple of first generation workers and as you go on you place your workers in the marriage spot and get more workers and when you run out of one workers you start in on the two workers and everybody has kind of a rondelle in front of them that represents the time that it takes for a worker to do something and often that's like training them or 
sometimes you can substitute time for other resources that you might not have. But when you get all the way around your rondelle, you've got to get rid of one of your lowest numbered workers, which means that they die. They come off the board and they go, if there's room, onto the town chronicle. They are a dead person that people talk about even after they're dead. But there's only so many spots in the town chronicle for each category of person. And so if the chronicle's full, apparently these people in this village have very short memories, they go in an unmarked grave. And when either chronicle is full or the unmarked grave spots are full, and in a two-player game there are only three unmarked grave spots, the game is over. I wouldn't call the time track a rondelle. It's a circular track. And yes, your piece does move around it, but there aren't any actions on it. It's just a timer. Yeah, it's wrapped around your player board, which represents your family's farm. And as Diana said, every time it makes a full rotation, you have to kill off one of your relatives of your choice from the oldest and thus the lowest numbered generation. You're sending these people out to work for you in various professions as craftsmen or council members or members of the church, that sort of thing. And you're keeping an eye on them in terms of what they can do for you while they're alive, whether they will give you any benefit at the end of the game in terms of points based on their position on, say, the council track or the church track, and when it would be a convenient time for them to, say, die so that they get a spot in the chronicle associated with their profession because the Chronicle has limited spots for limited parts of the board. There can only be a certain number of craftsmen slotted into the Chronicle. There can only be a certain number of councilmen slotted into the Chronicle. There can only be a certain number of travelers, and so on. And the more of your family members you have in the Chronicle at the end of the game, the more points you get. So the selective death of your family members can be a very valuable way to generate points over the course of the game. But of course, you want to be careful that you don't kill them off too early when you still need them to do their job. Other ways to get points involve selling goods that you've created to visitors to the town market. Going from town to town across the countryside will give you immediate benefits, but also the more towns your family has visited at the end of the game, the more points you get there. Moving your family members up the council gives you access to some pretty powerful actions, but the more family members you have in there, the further along they are on the track, the more points they will give you by continuing to be in the council at the end of the game. So you ideally want to keep them alive. And then there's the church which doesn't really provide any immediate benefits, although at the end of each round, the person with the most family members highest up in the church does get a small set of bonus points. But you really want your church members to stick around to the end of the game because they can be worth a lot of points there as well. The dogs have moved to our laps. They are hot dogs. Yes. Poor dogs. So the basic mechanism of the game is that There's a bag full of little wooden cubes, and a number of cubes, dependent on the number of players, come out, which are not all the cubes in the bag, so there's a little element of luck there of what's available. And they are placed out at random, a certain number of them, but random colors go down on several different sections of the board corresponding to the various categories of actions you can take. The craftsman space, the church space, the travel space, etc. On your turn, you have to take a cube off the board, and then you can take the associated action. And of course, it's more efficient to be able to do both, but sometimes you just have to take a cube off and you don't have whatever other resources you need or whatever to do the other thing, so you can just take the cube. The cubes are resources, and you often have to spend cubes to do other things, so they can be handy. But cubes are play cubes. And they make you spend time, which, of course, shortens your generations, which isn't exactly the way plagues work, but, you know, apparently in this game, that's how plagues work. And then when all the cubes are gone, that's the end of the round. There's a mass, which is the thing about getting extra points for having church members at the end of the round. 
And then the cubes go back in the bag and they come back out. Then you're ready to start another round. But for each player, when the round is going to end is sometimes less important than when your personal clock is going to come back around to the top and you're going to have to get rid of a worker. So it's got kind of an interesting round structure where there's the game rounds, but there's also kind of your rounds. It sounds a little bit like a worker placement game. It certainly looks like one if you just walk by and see it from a distance, but it's actually an action selection game because you can have multiple workers at any given space. It's more about whether the cube you want is available in a particular spot. And because the play cubes advance your family's time, you can use them to rush the end of the game or rush the death of a particular family member that you think would otherwise be beat out of a spot in the Chronicle because your opponent is about to retire somebody else. There are two expansions available for Village. The first one is called Village Inn, and it adds beer as a craftable trade good. It adds a tavern inn that you can go to and spend beer in order to pick up visitor cards, which will give you a one-time special ability. And then there is also the village port, which replaces the traveling section of the top right corner of the board with a more complex sea voyage section. We haven't played with either at this point. We decided to play with just the base game for my first game, and Matthew was reflecting at the time that it's the sort of thing that having played before is an advantage in in almost any game, really, but this one it's particularly noticeable that the sort of rhythm of who you want where and when you want to go there so that they strategically die or don't die and are still there at the end of the game is something that's easier to learn by doing than have explained to you, and so... If it's your first game and it's not the other person's first game, there's a pretty good chance you're going to lose. Not because you're dumb, but just because it's got sort of this very particular mechanic about killing off your workers that is different from a lot of other games, so you kind of need the practice. In your first generation, the one meeples are the ones that you start the game with, and there's a good chance that they won't survive to the end of the game. So when you're assigning them different jobs over the course of the first several rounds, you have to keep in mind that they may be going into the Chronicle and that there's a good chance, as I said, they won't be around to score you end game points. So where do you put your ones out? When do you put out twos and where do you put them? That sort of thing is something that having experienced the arc of the game, I think can be really helpful in deciding your strategy. There's also a dice game version, which is actually supposed to be about the same weight, which is unusual for a dice game version, called My Village, that I very much would like to play. The art style is functional, but not, I think, anything terribly extraordinary. It doesn't it doesn't cripple it, it doesn't elevate it especially, it gets the job done. Yeah, it's very old school Euro art, agrarian, European, medieval village life. The cubes are just colored cubes. There are no little wooden figures except for the meeples and the monks that are in the bag of the church. There's a certain amount of humor in when you send a member of your family to the church, they go into a bag and get drawn at the mass, and you can pay extra money to make sure they get drawn, or you can just go for the luck of the draw. And so I'll send somebody to the church. There's this moment of, whoa, into the bag they go. And trying to decide whether you would like to donate some of the very few very valuable coins in the game to the church to assure the ascension of your family member from the general rabble of the lower church members into a position of leadership that they can then start social climbing along the side of the church by paying grain over the course of subsequent rounds. Or you can As Diana said, you can take your chances and hope that some of the factionless monks in the bag don't get in the person's way and get drawn out instead. It's just a fun image in the course of the whole thing. The church is a large black bag. Yes, monks in a bag. Well, shall we uh, sign off before our dogs get any wigglier? Yeah. I think they might be thirsty. They are awfully wiggly. All right. Can't blame them. It's pretty hot. Yeah. So we will talk to you all again soon. I swear, soon.
email us at dice and dachshunds, that's A and D, at gmail.com with any questions, comments, suggestions for games we should cover, concerns, mistakes we made, anything like that. We'd also love it if you left a honest review on iTunes or the Google Play Store, where we are now findable, or Podbean, preferably iTunes or the Google Play Store, because most people don't know what the heck Podbean is. Also, we have a YouTube channel called Never Enough Games. Right now, there are some how-to-play videos, some basic miniature painting videos, a video game review, that sort of thing. I'm hoping to put up a how-to-play video of Great Western Trail soon, but it is an exceedingly complicated game. Let us know what you think. We'd love to hear from you. And thanks for listening. Good night.